Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. I'm excited to share with you something really cool. And today we're talking about these. So what is this flat gray ball and this chrome ball and what is their purpose? So stick around because this is going to be a really fun lesson. If you're new to the channel, welcome to VFX Central where we talk about all things visual effects from products, education, software, and much, much more. So hit the subscribe button and the notification bell so you get notified every time a new video comes out. And don't forget to like and share this video. This video was inspired by some comments I saw on the VFX subreddit where someone was asking what these were, the gray matte ball and the chrome ball. So we're gonna talk about that and its purpose. Basically, these are used as a lighting reference for uh, VFX and CG artists. So that's all, that is their main purpose, is so that you can see how light it reacts to uh, certain materials. So why gray and why chrome? Well, the gray one is actually used for light directions, uh, shadow intensity, like harsh shadows or soft shadows and making sure the light levels are the same. So what you would do is you'd recreate a, a gray matte ball in CG and you'd put it next to this one and then you try to get your lighting to match the same and move your lights in certain positions so that it looks like it's the same. You can see this kind of light fall off from my hand right there and you'd want to match that in uh, CG as well. So the chrome ball is um, you probably guessed, but for reflections. So it's being able to see your reflections, like if you have uh, like Transformers, a big metal robot, and um, you wanna see how its reflections are being picked up in the real life, this is what you'd use as a reference. This is also really helpful um, to line up what's called your environment light, or an HDRI and an environment light is a gigantic dome with a uh, 360 degree texture that's lighting your CG objects. And if you have this chrome ball, you can actually rotate that uh, environment, that dome environment around your CG objects to make sure it lines up the same. So just like we did with the gray map ball and creating another uh, CG gray map ball, we're gonna create a CG chrome ball and we're gonna also use that to help us line up our reflections so our reflections look correct in CG. And when you combine the two and you have, once you've kind of matched all of uh, those elements together, then you're going to be able to light your uh, CG objects correctly and there'll be some consistency. This was very helpful and this is why they use these on set. Now, when they shoot with these, they'll usually do a take, obviously with the actors doing their thing, and then they'll have the uh, VFX supervisor go out and get some shots either with this sitting on stand or they'll pick it up and they'll move it through a shot. And a reason why they would wanna move it through a shot is if I take this and I move it back, the light's gonna be a little bit different back here than it is here, and that's gonna help you line up maybe where some of your uh, lights fall off. So if you're in a forest, you'd wanna see maybe how the shadows are hitting your object. Now, if you're wondering where you can get something like this, I'm gonna leave a link in the description below and you can click on that and go purchase a little set like this that you can use yourself on your own productions or if you're VFX supervising, you can use that as well. You heard me mention a little bit about environment lighting and that dome that globally lights your uh, objects that we were trying to line up with this. And I wanna talk a little bit about that in some ways that you can create your own at home on a uh, pretty small budget. It is this right here. This is the Theta Rico 360 camera. This is like 150 bucks or something like that. I will also leave a link in the description below for one of these. And what this is, is a 360 camera. It has a camera in the front, a lens in the front, and a lens in the back. And it'll take an image and it will stitch those both together on this thing so you don't need another software. It'll stitch together this entire 360 globe that you can use and send it directly to your phone. It has a uh, Wi-Fi capability so I can snap it, it'll send it to my phone, and I can email it to myself, or you can plug this into your computer and upload it directly. Then you can use that panoramic, that 360 image, to light your objects. So if you were on set and you just had someone even acting like right here, what you would do is you would first maybe get a reference 
and then you would put this on a stand and with your phone, you could take a photo and it would capture a 360 image of this area so that we could use that in uh, our CG environment. Another cool thing about this camera is it can actually do HDR built into this thing. So what that means is if you're in an environment like this where outside is really bright and inside could be dark, it'll take two photos and merge them. So it'll do one exposed for inside, which may be darker, and then it'll set an exposure for outside, which is brighter, and bring it down. And then it'll merge those two images together and you'll have this really nice 5K 360 HDR image that you can use to light your uh, 3D objects or your CG effects. This 360 cam is really awesome and we're gonna do a little demonstration with it so you can kind of see how it works. So the first thing you're going to do is press the power button and you'll see all these little lights come on and you'll also see this Wi-Fi signal that it's sending to your phone. Now if you get the Theta app, you can pair your 360 camera to the app and you can preview what you're going to be taking. Now we are in the video 1080p mode and we can just switch that by clicking here to the previewing camera mode and if you pan around you can see the image that you're going to be taking. And then in the bottom right corner, we have the option settings. And in the option settings, we can turn on the HDR mode, which will help us get that high dynamic range and get better looking images. So I'm just gonna do this. It's gonna take a little bit longer, but it'll be a much higher quality. So that'll send to your phone via Wi-Fi. And you can see here is the image that we captured. Uh, the HDR image and you can see the outside looks pretty good. We then can use this 360 image to light our CG elements. So here's the image that we got from the Ricoh Theta and you can see it's a 360 image HDR, it's 5K resolution so you have plenty of resolution and this is what we're going to put on our um, environment light to be able to light our CG objects. So let's go jump on the computer and show you how that's done. All right, so here's the um, 360 image that we captured with the uh, Ricoh Theta and we need to do one little thing before we start using this in our CG environment. And what that is, is we need to match it to our back plate. We need to be matching the um, saturation, luminance levels and all that stuff so that uh, it looks correct. Now I did make a mistake and I should have filmed and recorded what's called a Macbeth chart. Let me show you what a Macbeth chart is. So this right here is a Macbeth chart. Now a Macbeth chart is what you would want to do is you would want to purchase one of these on Amazon or something and then you would want to hold it in your scene. So if I was holding it, you know, here in this scene, it wouldn't be the saturated, but I would want to hold it here and then maybe even have um, a version of this um, in the 360 camera. And then I would want to match the whites and the um, blacks and match the colors so that it's all the same. So that's another thing you want to do um, is have a Macbeth chart on set. So um, for now, we are just going to match this by eye and I'm going to show you what I did. Um, so this is kind of what I um, did to match it. I desaturated because I noticed the saturation was a lot higher on uh, my 360 and I noticed that the levels needed a little bit of um, help as well. So um, we can go through and, and do this, but this is essentially what you should do is try to match the luminance and saturation levels before we use this HDR. So I just brought this plate in and matched it um, as close as I could. Again, have a Macbeth chart and uh, try to match those luminance and saturation levels the best you can. All right, so now that uh, we have this matched um, to the best of our ability with our um, eyes, what we're gonna do is just export this out and I'll show you how to use this in Cinema 4D. When I'm saving files out, I like to just do save as. Um, let's just show you like, this and I usually will just do as a copy and I'll do a TIFF, not the layer, so it's just one thing. I'll call the HD, oops, let's HDRI and we'll save it here. I'm not going to do any compression, we don't have any transparencies or anything, so I'm just going to leave all that and hit OK. And usually that'll give you a really nice high resolution. All right, so here we are in Cinema 4D and I'm going to be using Redshift. So I know a lot of you use Octane and you can do the same type of thing in Octane. 
Um, I'm just more familiar with Redshift and I've uh, personally just been happier with the results I was able to get and the time it took. So with that, I'm gonna show you how we um, are gonna light this scene. So the first thing we need is the background. So if you go up to this little panel and choose a background. So we have our background right here and now we need the, um, the video file. So I'm gonna create a new Cinema 4D uh, image file or material file turn off reflectance we're not going to need that and here is my image sequence so I render out image sequences because they play back much better in Cinema 4D rather than mp4s or anything that anything like that so if you're bringing in movies make sure you're doing image sequences I'm gonna hit no to copy that over and then click on the file and go to this animation tab and hit calculate now we can see this is like way off and when I render this out, I should have made sure I set the uh, starting frame to zero. But if I just go to loop, this will enable it to, uh, to work for us. And so we can actually see uh, how many frames are in this shot. And it looks like there's 580 um, frames in this. Excuse me. So yeah, 580 frames. We're probably not going to do the entire animation, but I'll just kind of show you this how this works. So I turn this on loop so that um, it'll start at zero. Then we just take this uh, material and we put it on our background. And the next thing you need to do, and this is something again, um, I should have reminded you is make sure you're writing down what type of lens you're using. I um, checked and I believe I was at a 24. Um, so my focal length was 24. It's also good to know your uh, sensor size, all the information about your camera. It's gonna really help you just have a little bit more accurate results. So once you create your um, redshift camera, you're going to want to make sure you line up your horizon line. So I just did this by, you know, generally making sure this line kind of followed along the edge of that table, um, like so. So once our camera's aligned, we need to create two spheres representing um, the gray mat and the chrome sphere. So that's exactly what I did. And right now they have no materials on them, so they're just gonna not look very good. So we have to make sure this matches. So uh, in Redshift, let's go to our settings. Um, you wanna make sure that your GI is on. So I have it on brute force and a radius, uh, a radiance point cloud. So we get the um, correct global illumination. So let's just make sure that's on and close that window down. And I'm gonna open this uh, render window to so if you look, uh, this is what we're getting, no background, um, nothing yet. So let's start putting this thing in together. So the first thing is we want to bring in the environment light and the back plate. So let's just um, close this window down. And again, this background plate and this material is because it's Cinema 40s, it is only for our viewer. So um, you need to keep that in mind. So. Um, I'm also going to turn off the grid because that's kind of distracting and the horizon line cutting through my face. So you can just go over here to your filters and find the horizon. I'm going to turn that off. All right. Um, and if you're paranoid about your camera moving, uh, sometimes I just set a keyframe so that if I move my camera by accident, um, it's okay. We can just go back to the first frame and it'll bring it back. All right, so to get the background in our render view in the environment, we just go to our lights and bring in a Redshift dome light. And this is gonna be our dome light, so let's find the HDR. And here's the um, HDR that we exported. As you can see, there it is. And the next thing is we need a backplate. Now the cool thing is with Redshift is in the dome, you can have your uh, dome map um, you can have a backplate separate from your dome. So this is this was what li will light it and give our reflections, but this is what you can see in the viewer. So enable your backplate, click on this, and let's navigate to our image sequence. Click on that first frame, and I'm gonna hit no again. Go to over into animation, and let's turn this on loop as well. Hit detect, and okay, we found the correct amount of frames. Now, I believe we did we did export this out as 24 frames, so um, we can check that stuff a little bit later, but for now, we're just going to leave it. All right, 
So now let's open up our Redshift render window and check out what this looks like. Oh, and if your view jumps, it's because we have this view selected. So and you can see this because it's selected by that white border. Make sure you have the right window selected and there you go. And if you want, just lock it like so, and that way you um, it won't change positions. Now I'm just gonna zoom in here just so that we can look at um, these objects um, only and kind of compare them to the real ones. So right now it looks really blue, but actually this is correct. And it's um, because this is all daylight balanced, but these spheres don't have any materials on them. So let's throw some um, materials on these spheres to uh, line up our HDR and our lights. So if you go over to Reg of Materials, I'm just gonna go like this, click on Redshift Material, and we're gonna pause our render. For now, I'm just gonna use this um, view right here, and we're just gonna grab and drag our material right on there. Let's hit render and see what this is looking like. Okay, so it's not looking too bad, but uh, we definitely need to make sure it's the correct material. So I'm gonna double click this Redshift material, and in the presets, you can choose a silver ball or sphere, and this is gonna be a little bit closer to what we have. And for this um, demonstration, I'm gonna turn the roughness down and now we can start seeing our HDR reflecting in um, our Chrome ball. But we can see it's um, not matching this top one. So what we need to do is click on our dome, our dome light right here. And I'm just going to move this uh, over. Okay. And we just need to hit R to rotate. I'm going to move this up in the middle so you can see a little bit better. So I hit R to rotate. And watch my render view window when I start rotating my environment. You can see that now we're spinning our environment around and we want to line it up until it looks like it matches. And I think that's uh, pretty, pretty close. So there we go. So now we've at least lined up the perspective of our HDR. And that's going to be really helpful and is one of the first things we do. So we also need that um, gray map ball. So let's create a new material. So let's head over to Redshift Materials, Material. And we will drag this onto this ball. And again, we need to make sure it's the correct material. So um, click on your color and we it's good. It's at 50% gray. But um, the reflectance is too high or the... Uh, speculars too much. So let's turn up the roughness like so. So you're probably looking at this saying that still doesn't look correct. And you're right. <laughs> so why isn't this bright enough yet? Um, it looks like it's a little bit closer here, but it's still not um, correct. And that's what we need to talk about is how do we make it look the same? Well, the HDR dome can give us ambient light, but it doesn't give us this nice direct light. So we need to create some direct lights with um, some uh, redshift area lights. So we'll do that. So I'm gonna zoom out and I'm going to go to my lights and create an area light. And you'll see as I move this, Let's just start moving this thing around. You'll start seeing it. And you can actually see right here in the reflections. And this is also going to be helpful for us to figure out where this thing is. It's also good to get um, maybe a camera view, um, like take a photo on set where you know where lights are set up and you can kind of um, triangulate and figure out exactly where they are in 3D space just to get a little bit more accurate. So we can see in this reflectance about where we need to put this thing. So I'm gonna just try to move it so it matches my dome to the best of my abilities. And that's, that's pretty close. 
So we also need to turn up the brightness. So if I click on this area light and I start bringing up the brightness, you'll see it now it's starting to feel a lot closer to what we have in this image. Um, if I turn, it looks like my original sphere has a little bit more, um, almost like sheen to it. And we need to probably move this light um, almost like a hair higher, I feel like. And we can rotate this guy. So that's that's pretty close. We can see in the reflections and that's that's pretty dang close. The other thing we can do is take this area light and make it a child of the dome. So the reason why I did that is when I rotate my dome, you'll see that the area light is gonna move with it somewhat. I mean, you can't get away with it completely, um, but it definitely gives you a little bit more latitude. Okay. The other thing I want to um, bring up is the way there's a, there's a little bit of haze in this um, original footage, and that's because I had a filter on which I should have taken off called a black mist uh, pro filter. So it diffused, it raised my blacks a little bit and diffused it and things like that. Um, I'm also going to blur my reflections a little bit more. A little bit less, okay. And mine feels um, also a little bit warmer, like the environment feel, feels a little bit warmer, and that may be because we didn't color correct it exactly right. So if you wanna mess with um, that, you can actually turn your saturation down right here or do what you need to if you feel like it's not looking 100%. All right, so let's move on and let's figure out um, how we make this look even better because it's looking good, but it's missing some stuff. And I think some of the things you need to remember is, again, we're getting some ambient light, but why are the shadows here so dark and these ones are lifted? Well, the way light works is um, it shoots rays and they bounce off the table, off these walls, off me, and they bounce back onto these objects. So they're getting a lot of um, bounce based on distance. So you have these objects that are like, have you ever seen like a reflector or a bounce board, light will hit it and bounce off. And that's kind of what's happening here. So we, we're getting some of the ambient light, but not exactly what we need. So we can correct that a couple different ways. And in the dome light, if I turn this up, I'll show you a problem. That, so now it starts really um, just kind of blowing out right there. So we don't want to really do that. Um, the other thing you could try to do is you could try to bring it up maybe that way, but don't look at the chrome ball. Um, you can look at the gray ball and elevate it that way. And then in your material, see if you can um, somehow bring it down a little bit, which this this can get a little bit you know messy because now you're messing with materials to make it look correct. So. You have to be careful when you're doing um, stuff like that. So I'm gonna show you another way to fill in some of those shadows. And like I was saying, we can create some objects um, in 3D that can bounce light for us. So what we're gonna do is create a simple plane. Oops, that is a cube. We're gonna create a plane. Go back up here and we should create a plane. And let's move this right underneath our spheres. I'm gonna scale this up a little bit. And you can start seeing underneath that this blue light is kind of uh, bouncing up onto there. So I'm going to duplicate um, maybe this material. And we'll drag this onto the card. But I'm going to make it um, maybe a little bit brighter, not 50% gray. All right, so now we're getting a little bit of under, like a bounce underneath, but uh, the problem is we can see it. So the cool thing in 3D is you can hide a lot of this stuff. So what we're gonna do is we're going to right click, go to Redshift, Redshift Object, and override the visibility. We're gonna turn off Primary Visibility, so now it's gone. 
and we don't want to see it in these reflections so i'm going to turn it off visible in reflections um let's see secondary bounce nope there we go okay cast shadows off and let's toggle this on and off so if you look now we're getting we're filling in some of those shadows and that's because we have an object that is bouncing light back up onto the sphere so it's looking a lot more accurate now we still have this dark side and this one's a little bit lighter and that's probably because we have this wall over here and we have me so i'm going to duplicate this plane and the way i'm duplicating this if you're wondering you pause that is um if you if you click on an object and you um hold control and drag down it'll duplicate it so it's just a quick way to do that so um i know that we need to have a little bit of bounce over here so i'm just gonna create another plane duplicate that one and we're just gonna move right here let's hit render and let's see what that does see that's going a little almost too much so you may have to go up a bit higher maybe further back okay we're getting a little bit closer and, and this is the nice thing is we have this um, to compare and you and again you don't want to change the materials if you know this is 50% gray you know it's a lighting issue so that's why we use the chrome ball and the gray because you're trying not to manipulate the materials as much as you are just the environment to fit because then when you create other materials they will also look correct all right so let's duplicate this guy as well um, actually i'm going to delete that and control duplicate the bottom one so we can just drag this up so this is like our ceiling light because I had one light in the scene lighting this whole thing. So you're starting to be able to see how this is working. And that's already looking really good. This one is a little bit cooler and darker, it looks like. And um, that could be a that could be my dome light issue, an issue in there. So I could turn down um, that a little bit if it's uh, looking too bright. And or it could be a saturation. There's a couple different things, but it's definitely that's a lighting issue, and not so much as and the material issue, because we got to make sure that these materials stay the same. So that's already looking pretty good. I'm I'm starting to feel pretty satisfied about that. I did want to show you something cool in uh, Redshift about um, some of their shadow catching. So if you wanted these to cast shadows on objects. Um, let's just go to that first plane and if you go over into mat and you hit override and enable this is a shadow catcher so you turn that on as well and let's move those two spheres down and the problem is is I think I turned off the visibility so let's go back over to visibility and turn that on so now you can see these shadows and i can move that plane back it says the shadows aren't clipping you would obviously want to line you know maybe get some geometry that matches the table perfectly i'm just kind of roughing this thing in okay let's bring that over all right right on so yeah this is um kind of a way you can test out some of your um, your lighting situations um, now there is this big window and that is some diffused light coming in so we could emulate that as well um, which maybe we want to do because it look more real we can see those shadows are okay they're looking pretty soft so I am going to, um, for this sake, create a, another light behind the objects representing that window. And that should give us a little bit more uh, realism. So let me just pause this, create another area light. And we know this window is pretty huge. 
it's creating a lot of big soft um, light. So we're going to create a big soft light. Let's hit that. Okay, let's see. Maybe we need to turn up some of the brightness on this. It's not too bad. I'm going to um, move these objects back off the... Actually, I was going to show you one more thing on the ground plane. So ground plane in the matte object, you also can turn on reflection scale. So let's turn that on. Come on now. Oh, and this could be because I don't have a reflective object. So if I open this material, actually we're gonna create a separate material for the table. So I just duplicated this. We're gonna override this material, create a new table material, and we know the table is darker, but it's also shiny so it's pretty shiny it does have a um, nice little fresnel uh, fall off and maybe we'll do that too but for now we're just gonna do that I'm gonna hit re-render and that's actually looking a little bit better oh yeah and you can see the reflections so let's go in here so if I turn my reflections down back on now you can see we have our objects reflecting now, if we wanted to render something like this out, um, oh, really quick, sorry, this area light, um, I don't wanna see it in my reflections. So we need to turn the um, visibility, visibility of it off. And we can do that right here. Wait, oh, that's a visibility on. We need to turn the visibility in the reflections off. Excuse me. So let's do that. Um, yeah, effect specular, I'm gonna turn that off. And down in our other um, light, I'm gonna do that as well. And you'll watch that one disappear in the reflections. Um, just cause I want the reflections to come from my uh, HDR. So that's looking pretty, uh, we're, we're getting pretty close. Mine looks a little bit warmer, but overall um, it's looking really, it's looking pretty good. So if we wanted to render this out um, and we didn't want the background cause we wanted to have just control over our objects and maybe the shadows and reflections, um, what we would need to do is check our, our alpha. And we can see right now our alpha is totally solid white and that's a problem. So if we go down into our dome, we need to make sure the back plate is invisible. So I think if we hit the alpha channel replace. Um, this should hide this. Let's see. There we go. So now I turned the alpha channel replace on and that disappeared. And the same goes for this ground plane. So if I click on this um, redshift tag on the table and I believe we do the alpha down to zero, that's not what we want. We want effects from alpha. There we go. So now we're still getting those reflections and those shadows that we can render out. Um, here's our nice alpha pass. And it looks great. And if we look back at our RGB pass, there we go. Just want to show you the uh, final results of the lighting of the scene and um, kind of review a couple things. So we set up the um, dome. We aligned it with the, with the spheres. We set up a um, silver, I mean, uh, silver or chrome material, a 50% uh, gray uh, material. Um, and we aligned, again, the HER dome, some lights, added in some area lights, and bounced up some environment lights on these objects to give it to fill in some of those shadows. Now it wasn't perfect, like I said, because I did have that black mist uh, filter on my lens, and I could get something like that in here. But because we have this alpha channel, we can bring this in 
to compositing and lift the blacks and definitely get this look. We've got it um, pretty much there and it's looking um, pretty good. So overall, I'm pretty satisfied and uh, hopefully this was a great way for you guys to light your CG elements in your VFX shots. If you enjoyed today's lesson and you want to learn more about becoming a visual effects artist, then head over to vfxcrashcourse.com and enroll in one of our courses and learn how to become a VFX artist today. VFX Crash Course is our latest course and teaches you how to create a stunning visual effects shot from beginning to end. We will take you through the workflow, teach you software such as After Effects, Synthize, Mocha, 3D Code, Cinema 4D, Octane, Redshift, X Particles, Blackmagic Fusion, and Nuke, and much, much more. So enroll today and become a VFX artist. Well, there you go. So now you know how to create photorealistic CG renders, and I hope that this lesson was super informative and that you learned a lot. So learned what these did, learned how to capture your own 360 awesome image. And if you ever want to purchase any of these, I'm leaving links for um, everything on Amazon that you can get for this kind of stuff, my camera stuff, anything else, but this specifically will be in the description. And if you want this, I'm leaving a link. Um, I got this from a Chinese company, so go check it out and go see their products, really helpful. This will, uh, I believe, up your game as a visual effects artist or a generalist, supervisor, whatever. If you like to do your own VFX, this is a great tool to have on set. Leave a comment down below if you like this video, if you didn't like this video, if you have more questions about what we did, I would love to answer them. Again, thanks guys, and we'll see you next time.